Welcome back. It's time for another episode of WVU Radio, where we're talking about, well, we're talking about uh, marketing and all the things that uh, it brings with you and the intersection of data-driven marketing with the one woman who seems to get it all here. Hey, Cindy. Cindy Greenglass. Hey, Paul. How are you? I don't get all this new data-driven marketing. Marketing used to be an art. Now it's a science here. And you guys are at the at the forefront of uh, pioneering that science. Well, Paul, I think it's a little bit of art and a little bit of science. It's, and a little bit of magic all combined I think into so. one. <laughs> well, hopefully you've got a magical guest who can help explain all this to us today here. We do. I'm thrilled to welcome Susan K. Jones. Um, Susan is a tenured full professor of marketing at Ferris State University in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and a principal of Susan K. Jones Associates. She teaches direct marketing, digital marketing, advertising, and B2B classes at Ferris State, and her practice focuses on corporate training and seminars in direct and interactive marketing. Uh, She literally has a worldwide following with students in the United States, as well as South and Central America, Australia, Canada, Mexico, and Europe. Susan has co-authored more than 25 books, and she's been honored by the Direct Marketing Education Foundation, the Chicago Association of Direct Marketing, West Michigan American Marketing Association. She's received a John Caples International Award and been recognized by Ferris State University and Northwestern University as well as an educator and a practitioner. I'm always humbled and thrilled to spend time with Susan. She's also an adjunct instructor at uh, WVU in the Master of Science program in Integrated Marketing Communications and was selected by the students of the university for the prestigious Educator of the Year Award. So, um, Susan, welcome to our show. Thank you so much, Cindy, and let me say it's always an honor to be with you and talk with you because you are quite the expert yourself. <laughs> well, thank you, Paul. You see, it's the Mutual Admiration Society I, at WVU today. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I know, you know, I grew up in uh, suburban Detroit, so I'm familiar with Ferris State and all the okay. uh, lots of friends that went there. Uh, and I know it's far away from where we are, but we got to get Susan to talk up just a little bit. She sounds really distant here. Oh, okay. All right, let me talk up a little more. Sounds All right. Better? That sounds better. Okay. okay. Right. Thank you. Well, Susan, today we're going to discuss the continued move towards the integration of direct and digital marketing and how the balance of online and offline media is continuing to be focused on the consumer. Um, I'd like you to share with us and talk about trends in database marketing. And you know how Paul was saying it's become more science than art, but you know, Susan, you're really a creative person. So uh, it'll be really interesting to hear how does a creative person uniquely contribute to the use of insights from the database and how do you handle all of this data and make sense of it and still be creative. So looking forward to a quick half an hour together and um, (laughs) I'm going to start us off with um, my first question for you. You know, many in our industry feel that direct marketing is kind of an old, tired expression, and no longer is it an effective description for the practice of measurable communication. In fact, I believe that you are advocating the use of direct and digital marketing uh, as opposed to just direct marketing. Um, can you tell me how this developed and you know, why you feel that this may be a better moniker for the, dis- the industry today? Sure. Well, one reason, Cindy, why I feel this way is that it gets away from this concept of it's one or the other, and it really isn't one or the other. When I work with students, sometimes they'll say, well, the old-style marketing is dead. It is not dead. It's just used in a different way, perhaps, integrated with digital marketing. So for most of our campaigns, what we're going to be looking at is where is the consumer, where can we find the consumer, And it's very seldom just online or just offline with print or TV. We need to figure out how to reach that consumer, and the consumer pretty much tells us where they want to hear from us. 
So when marketers say this medium's dead or that medium's dead, I have to ask them, is that your perception or the perception of your target market? Uh -huh. So with digital marketing coming on so strong, sh you're saying we should uh, not uh, start planning those funerals <laughs> and eulogies for traditional media? Right. right. I love what the late uh, Alberto Echo, who was a novelist but also a communications commentator, had to say about this. He said when new media come along, it doesn't kill the old media, it uh, encourages them or pushes them to redefine themselves. So when we think about the history of uh, arts and communications, when photography came along, it certainly did not keep people from doing oil paintings. And when uh, film came along, it did not keep people from uh, staging stage plays or attending stage plays. People thought, uh, r really thought that TV would kill radio, but it really hasn't. It has redefined radio. And we see the same thing happening with digital marketing taking its own niche and redefining what we do with traditional media. So as an example, with TV, many more marketers are sending people online. So they will say, go to this URL or even better, this specific landing page, and you're going to see something that takes this conversation further. Or the same thing with um, direct mail. We don't have to send out, in many cases, a huge package anymore. We can send out a big postcard that says, here's all the sizzle about this. Now go online, and you're going to see much, much more on our website. The other thing I would say is that even though newspaper circulations are way down, newspapers now can be used in a way that direct like, which is it's more of a focus medium because most of your readers are age 50 plus. Young people may not read a daily paper, but I'm 50 plus. I won't tell you how much more than 50 plus. And I grew up reading the newspaper. So I read the newspaper every day and I see those ads. I do notice that a lot more of the ads are for um, assisted living <laughs> and new kinds of bathrooms and uh, you know, that kind of thing, that, that that's who's reading the newspaper. The newspaper's not dead, it's just redefining. And the same thing with magazines. People will say, oh, magazines are dead. But if you look at, if you go into a major bookstore, you see aisles of very um, focused magazines, highly targeted magazines in all kinds of areas. So if you look at the skiing, the uh, ski, skiing and snowboarding magazines, for example, or if you're interested in decorating, you've got country living, Victorian living, modern, contemporary, uh, low end, high end, and direct marketers love these because they are narrow niches and the while there may not be huge circulations, everyone who's reading those magazines is really into that subject. So I would say, yeah, and oh, let me also mention catalogs. There are several examples where people actually admitted that this happened. They decided as marketers, oh, we're not going to have to use catalogs anymore because we'll just assume everybody's going to go online. Well, the uh, uh, silence was deafening on their websites, and they realized that catalogs still serve a great purpose. Catalogs are a reminder, oh, yes, I like that company. That company has some great things. I think I'll go online and consider buying something right now. So all in all, you can tell I'm, <laughs> I'm agreeing, no, no funerals for traditional media anytime soon. <laughs> well, thank you, Susan. It, it makes me think of what we're doing here today where you say, you know, traditional radio is now right. streaming. But a podcast right. is a, a, a channel delivery of radio. And, you know, I drive two hours uh, each way to uh, commute, two hours each way to work every day. So um, I don't get a lot of time to read a book, but I love to sit and read a book. Um, but now I consume a lot of books on tape, you know, when I'm driving. So I'm, mm -hmm. I've got Audible yeah. streaming in my car. I get home, I pick it up in the hard copy version when I'm sitting in my living mm -hmm. room. So we've given consumers choice of how they consume yes. information. We haven't eliminated the way in which we deliver it. Would that be accurate? That's right. Yes, definitely. And you mentioned podcasts, and I think people were thinking that podcasts were going to be outmoded with the move toward video, but 
podcasts are hotter than ever, as exemplified by what we're doing here today, and people are loving podcasts. Yeah, me too. Um, so, <laughs> you know, you you mentioned catalog, print, email, streaming, you know, so we hear direct and digital, we hear multi-channel, and then we hear mm-hmm. the all-important phrase now, omni-channel, omni-channel, right. everything's everywhere all at once. Uh, is this right. really possible, Susan, or is this kind of like a future state? Well, I would say that some of the bigger marketers are already doing it, and to me, the focus of Omnichannel is we focus everything around mobile marketing, and so what's on our handheld device is going to be the key. I was just talking to my son, who's really immersed in apps and this type of marketing, and he was saying that marketers are now working on foot traffic observation. So we talk about beacons in stores that Cindy's walking through the store and she's got her app open and says, hey, Cindy, here's a special deal for you. But another thing those beacons can do is say, oh, Cindy's walked into the home goods department and here's how long she stayed. Or Cindy went to the grocery store and she was in the soup aisle for quite a while, but she didn't even go into the um, milk aisle. And what they can do with that is then do some testing and say, send out an ad to half the people in their um, database and the other half don't get it or some percentage. And then they can check and see next time Cindy goes to the store, did that ad impact whether Cindy went to the end cap and bought something? So the people that got the ad, did they buy more than the people that didn't get the ad? It's absolutely fascinating to me and it's what we can do with that handheld device with so many of us being on it at all times. In reality, I only see the larger companies really um, doing this today, but I think that it will, like everything else in the digital world, uh, we will see it evolve so that smaller companies might be able to use those applications as well. It's, in, in one way, it's very exciting as a marketer. As a consumer, sometimes I wonder, are people going to appreciate being sort of followed around the store that way. We shall see. (laughs) Yeah, it reminds me of, um, now I'm going to kind of show a little bit of my age here. It reminds me of a a Tom Cruise movie. Um, Do you remember um, that movie? I I can't remember the name of it now, where he's running, he's being chased. Yeah, he's he's walking through uh, areas and uh, he's seeing ads that are just for him. Yes, yes. Yes, uh huh. Minority right. Report. That's what I think. Minority that's Report. That's, that's, and it's kind of yeah. scary, right? Look creepy. They're like, Tom, mm-hmm. Tom, those pants you just bought are on sale. I remember thinking, that's never going to happen. And here right. we are. We're oh, living yeah. that reality. Um, mm-hmm. So we're going to take a quick break in, 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 a, in, a, okay. in about a minute. But before we do, right. I want to just pose a question and give you a chance to think about it while we um, are on break and, and hand it back to Paul. Um, you come from a creative background, but you teach subjects that revolve around robust databases, analytics, pretty heady scientific stuff. H- how do your creative skills help you to use information from databases, and and how is it that you can do left brain and right brain? So I want you to think about that, and when we come back from break, I'd like you to address that. I will. All right, while they're pondering those heady questions here, we're going to remind you, as always, that you know, marketing is more than just ads and press releases. That's certainly what we're talking about today. Marketing is about building relationships. And if you're looking to build relationships with other marketing professionals, there is a place. West Virginia University's conference in Morgantown, West Virginia, coming up real shortly, August 1st through 4th this summer. It's called Integrate, and it's a network and learning experience where you can hear speakers representing large and innovative organizations like Cisco and Facebook, as well as agencies like Cappuccino and Fujicato. Pretty simple to find out more. Just go to the website, integrate.wvu for West Virginia University. Integrate.wvu.edu. That's integrate.wvu.edu. 
And while you're there, you might also want to wander around the website and learn more about West Virginia University's online data marketing communications program. It's the first graduate program to focus on data's impact on marketing communications. It sits right at the intersection that we're talking about today between new media models and new data streams and traditional media and methodologies. You can learn innovative strategies from award-winning faculty like the people we're talking to today as you shape the future of marketing. Learn more at DMC for Data Marketing Communications, dmc.wvu.edu. Well, I think I finally mastered the uh, nomenclature here, the various uh, letters and acronyms for all these uh, educational uh, programs here. I think I'm getting better at it. You're doing great, Paul. You're doing great. (laughs) And, in fact, Susan and I will both be attending Integrate 2018 coming up at the end of this month. It should be a a really terrific opportunity to hear some um, great uh, practitioners and speakers and and reconnect with you, Susan, live. Can you you give us any uh, advance uh, uh, teasers as to who's going to be there, what you're going to talk about here? It's coming up pretty quick. Yeah, well, well we're going to be I there. What, what more do you what need? More need, do you need? Right? Why, why am I even asking? <laughs> <laughs> I think all of the uh, hosts are going to be there that we have on the show. Um, there's over yeah. 28 instructors that are going to be there as well. Um, many of the guests we've had on this uh, um, podcast series will be there live, too. So is it just um, panel discussions, one after the other, or are there networking opportunities where you can meet people, not just from your organization, but from the others attending and are there breakout sessions what, what do i see having never been there what would i see over the couple of days ah. there well, so it's kind of fun that um, because we're in West Virginia, which actually is known for its outdoors, its fantastic, rugged and outdoor environment that you're going to have, like um, uh, rappelling and, and, oh. and zip lining and all sorts of great <laughs> opportunities to do things outdoors. You get to experience the campus. There's um, a, an opportunity to have dinner and an evening and a gala with your fellow alumni and, and students of both the IMC and the DMC program. There are uh, keynote speakers from uh, representing industries um, across the country, bringing first-hand cases that they've dealt with uh, across all of these different parts of marketing communications that we uh, are dealing with. And then there are the the opportunities just to network, lunches, breakfast, to get to to meet people that you work with online on a day-to-day basis, and 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 you see. And get to be with them for the first time. It, it's a wonderful opportunity, and and Susan, that's where they give the the instructor of the year, right? Award. Yes. yes, always fun to see who the students choose. I was so honored to receive that a few years ago, because it is from the students, and that's really special. But I I'm very much looking forward to integrate, and uh, I always do. So much to learn, and uh, as you say, meeting people that you only talk with online, whether it's prospective students, current students, or alumni, to see what our alumni are doing, that's really fun, too. Right. Well, so, Susan, let's talk about your creative yeah. background, and how is it that you've okay. been able to do this right brain, left brain art and science here? Well, I think I would be the first to say that I'm not a math whiz. I don't do... Uh, heavy-duty predictive analytics myself, but I am always asking, what can this tell us? Can you show me this in a report that I can make some sense of? And when I do that, I, being a more of a right brain person, I will try to create, conjure in my mind a picture of who the target market is, and then I'll actually try to find somebody like that so that when I'm doing creative work, I'm not writing to a target market. I'm writing to a person, or we call it a persona now, somebody who represents the target market, their hopes and fears and dreams, what they like, what they don't like. And that allows us to really key into how to um, impress them about our product and make them interested in our product or service, as opposed to a very general statement. And then I'm really... in. The class that I teach at WV, we talk about predictive analytics, which is fascinating to me, being able to say, if we know these 10 things about this person, what should we offer them next? What would be the next best thing to put in front of that person? And so I find it all very exciting, but 
you don't have to be a heavy-duty math whiz or a data scientist to use data. You, you just have to be curious and interested. Well, there you So that, I think, is very reassuring. So many of um, the students that I, I meet uh, and people in general in the marketing profession, you know, we chose marketing because we're communicators. We we feel comfortable right. in that environment. We, we are the great communicators. And um, many of us did not come up through the, the, the math and science in school. Many of us you know, didn't mm-hmm. feel comfortable in math classes or take stats in undergrad. And, and there's a general sort of fear that, you know, well, I can't be good at this because I don't have a stats or an analytic background. So there's hope for us great communicators if we don't oh, have... You <laughs> <laughs> I would say you do a wonderful job of this. City. You're, you're somebody that I remember your talk about big data and how to make sense about big data, and I thought you were pretty good with the data yourself there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Susan. So, you know, database marketing these days, um, databases, they're pretty complex with all the data, talking about big data. There's so much data that's coming in, not only the complexity of it, the cost and expense mm-hmm. of it, the need to have people who are know how to deal with it and think about it. Can small companies and, and you know, companies that aren't the big behemoths, they're not, you know, Intel and Facebook, can they afford to um, develop and use databases and big data, or is it just for the big guys? Well, I think they can't afford not to at this point. If you even look at some of the local um, coffee shops and sandwich shops, they are using a swipe card or a login with a phone number so that they're not just counting how many sandwiches did we sell today, but they can look in and see, okay, Susan's come 10 times and she always bought this sandwich. She comes on Thursdays but not on Mondays, all those types of things. And it's so much more helpful than just having a, a little punch card. There's still a number of companies that are just using a punch card, and they say, bring in your card, and you do buy 10 of whatever, we're going to give you one free. But how much more helpful would it be to know all that information about the person, not just that they bought 10 times, but what days did they buy, what type of thing did they buy? Did they only go to one store? Did they go to multiple stores? And this is all pretty affordable. I would suggest that anybody that's interested in that, and I don't get a kickback from this company, but I would say salesforce.com, they are able to help people even with uh, pretty small businesses to use a customer relationship management program and to help them really organize their data and be able to talk more intelligently and specifically to their customers. So the answer is small businesses, you should definitely look into it. Great, very good advice. Um, We use Salesforce here and um, it's pretty intuitive. Um, Mm -hmm. And now we're talking data. Um, I I would um, be remiss if I didn't bring up, I call it the um, four letter word of the ages right now and that would be (laughs) G. GDPR, which is on everybody's right. mind these days, but um, GDPR, right. which in Europe um, mandates people's right to be forgotten, um, it mandates how we handle and work with data, it legislates and, and, and penalizes companies, it's, it, it's really scary for, for, you know, it's created a great deal of concern for marketers, granted right sure. now it's in Europe, but, but you know, the because it's happening in Europe, is it coming? Is it coming this way across the ocean? And should we be afraid well, of it? Yeah. I would say, you know, I was in Europe when GDPR went into effect in May. And I will say that there's certain, uh, well, any company, any U.S. based company that wants to do business in Europe has to conform with GDPR already. So I remember reading that the New York Times had not conformed and therefore nobody in Europe could see that newspaper until they did conform to these laws. And I, uh, right around the time the GDPR went into effect in Europe, every site I would go to would be popping up and saying, do you accept cookies? Do you know what cookies are? Will you accept our privacy policies? Here they are. And they, you couldn't get into the site until you did that, which is part of what GDPR mandates. 
But to talk about the U.S., I, I've read that California is looking at some pretty extensive privacy legislation, and of course they're sometimes on the cutting edge of things that are uh, consumer protection. I think they were the first to say that you had to have signs in bars saying pregnant women shouldn't drink and things of that nature. Maybe New York City will because the Mayor Bloomberg didn't want people to buy big gulp of soda. <laughs> it depends how protectionist a, a government is. But going back to my point about the beacons following us around stores, the more that consumers understand that that's going on, I think the more concern there's going to be and the more questioning of our legislature, legislators about what should be done about this and how much should be done about it. I have been informed that American Express is thinking about providing specific information on what its customers buy to other businesses. And that, to me, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Cindy, but it was always sort of a pledge that credit card companies would not tell others exactly what we bought. They might use right. that information themselves, but now it seems like that might be up for grabs. So I think my short answer is the more daring marketers get, the more I think consumers are going to be saying, wait a minute, I want to opt into this or opt out of it. I don't want this to just happen. So I think we better watch for that, yes. Yeah, you know, Susan, I agree with you, and and, and my feeling on it with you as well and, and others in the industry is you, if you self-regulate and you're careful and you're mindful and um, you appreciate that we, we have the, the privilege of um, having a dialogue and engagement with our customers, but we cannot abuse the privilege in the relationship. Right. And if we self-regulate exactly. and we're respectful of people's trust and privacy, then we'll be fine. But if we don't, then, you know, caveat emptor, right? Uh, we right. may be legislated right. out of this business. So we all better be careful right. and understand that we have an obligation and a responsibility in this area. Um, so we're going to be wrapping up here. Um, Susan, I, I do want to congratulate you on 10 years at WVU. Congratulations. Thank you you. have uh, many exciting. raving fans. Uh, I am uh, just one of a, a plethora of fellow students who have had the great good fortune to have had you as a, a professor. Um, and I, I hope that, you know, there's 10 more years and you just keep it coming. Okay, well, uh, that would be my plan, Cindy, and I look forward to seeing you uh, the 1st of August. See you August that's 1st in great. West Virginia. Yeah, that's right. All right, back to you, Paul. You've been listening to another episode of WVU Marketing Communications, brought to you live right here on the Funnel Radio Channel for at-work listeners like you.